Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from three exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alessio. Hello. Cara. Hi. And I will be your host, Alexis. Alessio will discuss the game Unreliable, Unreliable Wizard. Uh, yeah, while, Ca- <laughs> while Cara will talk to us about... Ar- artisans of... Splendent Veil. Vale. <laughs> Sounds delightful. Uh, and I will be introducing the game uh, The Turing Machine. But first, we'll see how everyone is doing in the Stanley Catch-Up. So, how have you been doing, Carl? Um, well, I've been doing very well, I have to say. Um, my mom and I joked that our complaints about the year 2024 have been heard and the year is really <laughs> trying to better itself. Um, so my transfer uh, went through. Uh, yesterday I sent out all the um, hiring documentation. Um, so, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> we are all extremely happy for you. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, have a break. <laughs> and also uh, health issues in my family uh, are resolving itself and so um yeah that's really good um it does mean i have a lot of things going on with uh now having to finalize my move into my house and finishing uh necessary works here right now i'm breaking through a wall so i can put my fish tank into the wall and uh in this little house from the 70s or so um it's quite interesting to open up one of these walls and seeing what's in there and how it's cockroaches. <laughs> there are cockroaches. Um, <clears throat> nah, but uh, it has it has layers and yeah, um, you wait and see. Anyway, so um, yeah, apart from that, on the board gaming side, um, I haven't gotten around to playing anything else but the game I'm talking about today. Um, but um. I bought two new games. Um, one we talked about on this podcast, Keep the Heroes Out. Um, yeah. I think it was Alessio. It's, yeah. It's your fault. I spent money. Um, yeah, I sold you this game. And um, also uh, Senjutsu Battle for Japan, a uh, one, two, four player skirmish game. And. Um, It was a sale, it was really cheap, and uh, I remember backing it on Kickstarter, but then backing out again because I really disliked how they handled the uh, whole Kickstarter, and there was a lot of FOMO and whatnot. And, um, but then there was this sale going on, and I noticed, hey, I can basically get almost everything that was sold in the Kickstarter for less than it cost in the Kickstarter. (laughs) Okay. Uh, You've also mentioned that you've been uh, trying to play a less diverse game and focus on the one to finish the ones that you you had started recently. Yes, exactly. Um, And that was going. I'm not sure if I talked about it in the podcast itself, but um, yeah, um, with the podcast, I noticed that I developed this tendency to start playing a lot of games, but not finishing any. (laughs) So, um, and um, now I decided, no, I actually want to finish games. So the game I'm talking about today will keep me busy for a bit longer. (laughs) Um, I think I'm a third through it, but um, yeah. And um, I I really like this decision, Um, not playing games because I feel like I have to play uh, or try out a new game to, to cover it in an episode, but just, you know, playing the game because I want to play it and I want to see where it goes. (laughs) That's commendable. Yeah. Anyway, I think that's mostly it from my side. Um, how about you, Alessio? Oh well, uh, I'm actually still buying games, so not not that good. <laughs> well, I'm buying uh, games as well. I'm just yeah, yeah of them, course. Which is <laughs> no, I, I what I mean is 
actually my, my I, I really I really appreciate your approach to this kind of game because I I really would like to have that kind of resolution uh, resolve okay okay that kind of resolve I mean uh, I usually finish a game out of willpower actually I'm entirely moved by willpower at this point because uh, there is no sleeping time no, no, not that not anything uh, I am a computer programmer as a day job so there's a lot of work in this period because our customers get to certification in September and so in the, the entire summer is a time where you get customer tickets because they need to have everything set up and aligned and so on so there's a lot 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 of work and I play on night time but I am a father of two and also an husband i i am remembered so <laughs> actually that there's a lot to do and usually what uh, gets what what is left out is sleep so but it's good news for game inside because i actually am trying and getting a lot of games this this period there's been the the, the italian fair in modena i didn't participate this year but the the the, the most relevant uh, entry in Modena games was the uh, was primal the the reckoning the the one game from Reggae Games we which is a publisher from Mac uh, we covered it on and off it is a boss battle card game it actually turned out a bit better than we expected so it's actually a very good product uh, except for the miniatures they are still useless except for table presents of course uh, but we'll see if we can cover it or whatever anyway uh, that aside uh, since I, I I've been meddling a lot with Italian players I got a bit of Italian taste these days so uh, all my news are from here uh, for instance uh, uh, since uh, an Italian podcast brought brought it up uh, I'm trying Ila and something shiny which is uh, an old kickstart uh, kind of old it's actually two years old or something uh, uh, cartoon bunny from a Chinese designer uh, and is an adventure about uh, loss of innocence which is actually uh, it looks simple it has a straightforward mechanic it is cutthroat and it's terrible it's a uh, it's a gut punch for everything especially if you are a parent so <laughs> I, I'm not finished it yet so I have yet to form an opinion but I probably want to talk to, about it uh, in the future I'm trying Veil of Eternity, which is uh, a, a very fun card game, uh, which is actually widely available on Board Game Arena, but uh, and it's actually widely ab available in every language except Italian. So we basically don't get uh, a localized version, and it's uh, very hard to get in Italy. So since it was very hard to get, uh, I secured a copy long ago and it's just coming up, so I'm playing it. And this is basically it. At Modena I learned about this Kickstarter, which by the time we will listen to this episode will probably be in uh, Late Pledge. But there's Lightspeed Arena, which is uh, a kind of... Uh, spacefaring battle game with a twist you <laughs> actually have a look because it's a very simple game the base pledge is 25 euros just have a look and see for yourself the the the, the twist because the 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 authors uh, asked for people to have a look at the video before giving any comments so I'm just uh, uh, continuing their will and uh, that's it basically just a lot of things happening a few things happening and that's me uh, that aside I'm playing uh, quite a bit of the game I will be talking about and I got my hands on uh, Leviton Wiles 
uh, of which fan talked about uh, last episode, I think. And yeah, yeah, I, I can see the Shadow of Colossus vibe. Maybe the writing is a bit uh, more silly. If I did if you I join the, the Kickstarter? Because I'm actually waiting for the reprint right now to buy it. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's uh, available at the moment. Yeah, uh, that's this website. Uh, I am sure there are everywhere. Of uh, it's called Vinted, which gives you oh, which is, true uh, Vinted. Yeah, a yeah, lot, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there are a lot of Italian games, uh, and uh, I found a copy of Le Leviathan Wild since we got a heads up oh. from Fen. I just secured a copy. Oh, that's it, great! I didn't know it's that. It's a pretty they... decent price. I think it's the Kickstarter edition because I have wooden meeples and wooden tokens. And there is also cardboard, so it's okay. It's for less than 60 euros shipped, so it should be reasonable, I think. So that's it. There is also an expansion about muta mutations, but I didn't try it. Anyway, that's me. What about you, Alexis? On my end, uh, I've not had the time to play too many board games. I've played a bit of the one that I'm going to talk about today, but I mostly uh, continued the Seven Citadel, uh, plowing through, through it and so far having a lot of fun with, uh, with what I'm playing. And uh, I'm preparing a tabletop RPG campaign that I'm going to play uh, soon with a few friends. So not too many things uh, at the moment, but still having fun yeah uh, yeah there will but... be the expansion of certain citadel uh, the, the the new threat at, at least one on yes the they are they, have, they announced yeah. a new uh, a new kickstarter that should start within the next month and it's going to be exciting um there were a few expansion with the base game in the the first uh, kickstarter but i only got one of those the other one didn't seem to be too interesting especially since there were more like little modifiers onto the game rather than brand new campaigns so having like a new threat in the in the next kickstarter seems interesting and i'm probably going to go for those uh we'll have to see though yeah i want right. to see the, what they will do to yeah. the map yeah. but <laughs> at the moment i've mostly been playing uh turing machine which uh is the game that i'm going to talk about today so it is a code-breaking game inspired by the work of famous mathematician and cryptanalyst Alan Turing, published in 2022 by Scorpion Masquet. It is a game of logical deduction suited for one to four players. The game recreates early mechanical computers by giving the player punch cards to try and figure out a uh, hidden code. To do so, the player will ask logical questions that will allow them to slowly deduce the parameters of the answer. The game is perfectly suited for solo play and actually got a few awards uh, specifically regarding uh, solo play. Solo. <laughs> but if you are playing against others, the goal will be to be the first to guess the code, so to guess the code in the minimal amount of question, basically. How does it work then? Well, the game comes with a code book with different solutions for the game, and there's also a website with a ton of configuration for the game to be set in, making sure that you never uh, never run out of steam with it. Uh, either through the manual of the website, it will tell you uh, to put a few cards down. On the back of those cards, there's a series of dots that represents answers to specific questions. And those questions are going to be in the form uh, of little uh, cards that you can put next to it with a hint to uh, that will give you a hint about the bigger code that you're looking for. For example, it will tell you how many five there are in the final code or compare the first digit with another digit. So you have a set of punch cards with numbers that go from one to five. Your goal is to take three of those cards to form a three digit number and with one, uh, once they are linked, uh, once we, they are lined up, you will block all of the. They will block all of the holes onto those punch cards except for one. Uh, you then compare that number to one of the question to see if uh, that specific code answers the question asked on that card correctly. So, for example, uh, let's say that you have 
one of the questions that allows you, that asks you if there's more odds or even digit in the final code. If you are asking for the code two to one, there will be a green dot if there are more even digits, and there will be a red dot if there are less odd digits than um, if there are more odd digits than even digits. Uh, the game feels very nice to play because it has, has a cardboard component that you need to manipulate, there's punch cards. I always like a bit of physicality in my games, so that's always fun. Uh, and if you like logical deduction, uh, that is just the perfect game to, to play with uh, either by yourself or with a couple of friends that are uh, smart like, like this to try to deduct uh, numbers and to try to pick up clues from uh, from this. There's a little bit of a mathematical uh, reflection too. Uh, I personally love to do Sudokus and any kind of uh, mind games like this. So this really fits me well. Uh, I've enjoyed the game quite a lot. I believe that, Alessio, you played it. Uh, Cara, I'm not sure. I played the shit out of it. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Uh, like I said, I'm a computer programmer. So I, 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 there's a lot to say about it, but... Uh, I can go on an in-depth analysis if you want, but I don't know if you would like it. Anyway, uh, a thing I have to say about this game. Uh, this game is uh, the perfect solo game, I think. It's... Uh, uh, let me say this. Uh, I am one guy who likes to feel smart, okay? When I... Uh, when I succeed in something which is apparently hard I feel satisfied I get satisfaction out of it so that's how I like puzzles uh, th there's a word uh, I think it's from old Latin which uh, which in turn has an old an ancient Greek uh, derivation which is called enigmistics but I don't know if this is what this is how English speaking people call puzzles but there is a lot of uh, classic games like this, like charades uh, and something like that. And these games uh, all work with the same kind of cryptography you use in, tu in Turing Machine. They make you feel smart because you get to the solution by connecting the dots, by induction. And uh, Turing Machine does it perfectly and smartly. You have uh, uh, the... Uh, Alexis picked the the most difficult game to describe playing because actually you put you you basically have, you, you basically have a set of selectors. The code you have to guess is made by a set of of selectors which give you a choice yes and no. And uh, uh, depending on the selectors you use, this is more or less difficult because of course uh, the third digit is a two is a very specific selector. Uh, there are more odd than even numbers is a less specific selectors and you need to combine them and get the result of everyone because when you play multiplayer you get uh, the questions from everyone and you try to do that in the least amount of tries this is the perfect game for the smart junkie because <laughs> you actually want to feel smart you get high from getting from feeling smart and this is the game for you for that it is actually pretty nice there is uh, the one big downside if you don't like to play charades you don't like to play Turing machine that's basically it if you don't like puzzles you won't like a puzzle game of course but that's it the game is very ingenious and uh, that, that's why I thought uh, the Golden Geek Awards when we first uh, talked about it uh, that it should have been the, innovat the most innovative one and not uh, the Cat in the Box which is still a good game but not that innovative because that's a way to approach stuff it's still the, good, the same old Turing machine it's actually uh, a fun fact uh, the Turing machine was a thing that could uh, read, write and move, uh, and move uh, on a tape so, and the tape was infinite so that's... Uh, Actually, not the Turing machine, but it works on a yes, no. It's actually Turing computable. It's fun because, uh, okay, th this is getting analytical and I don't want to get analytical, but the name is pretty right for the title. So 
Yeah, I like it. <laughs> yeah, it's a great game, I think. Yeah, I have to stop myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, I would, I would definitely yeah. recommend it to anyone that likes puzzle. Uh, that's for sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so, no, which... I I really have to, to to say two things about the difficulty and the satisfaction you get. Yes. <laughs> Okay, uh, the one thing about difficulty is that the first two levels of difficulty are actually very comparable to what you do on the beach in uh, summer, like uh, crosswords or something like that. The, the easiest level of difficulty can be done by a 10 year old, so it's okay. The second best uh, level of the second easiest uh, level of difficulty is uh, a bit challenging, but you just need to think about it, and then it gets to the serious stuff. Uh, the game is beautiful because it gets expanded online pretty continuously. I played regularly uh, until I think March this year, then uh, work came in, so. I didn't play it uh, every so often, but I get monthly the challenge from the web and still play them uh, until recently, so very, very fun. And the difficult challenges are actually very, very difficult. That ties into the, the kind of satisfaction you draw from this. Uh, this is all for programmers only but it feels like debugging a memory error, meaning that uh, the challenging mods are basically have you guessing like from the uh, like the hard Sudokus, okay? Uh, when you play a Sudoku, you have the easy one with the two or three numbers on each square, or you have the difficult ones when you have to infer information from what you do not get. And uh, those are the, the one uh, you feel the trickiest and you get the most satisfaction from. Uh, the hardest level of difficulty of the Turing machine work like that. They are really the, the perfect expansible pus uh, puzzle. So beautiful. All right. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which one of you two wants to go first for the, the topic? Oh, uh, if you want, I can go with a reliable wizard, which uh, is... Yeah, go for it. Yeah, uh, I decided for a reliable wizard this episode because a reliable is a beautiful word to put in a title. So we'll probably use it in the title of the episode. <laughs> and uh, uh, what about it? Uh, a reliable wizard is a solo game from Kami Bayashi who is uh, a very good Japanese designer who published this game entirely in Japanese. If you go look on uh, BGG uh, about the game, and go on, I will wait. Yeah, if you look there, you will see that is, uh, it has a lot of... It is a pixel art game with the very, very simple, very clean graphics. Uh, I I will make a point about pixel art games, but uh, later. And uh, it is a very, very simple game, which is for a single solo player, which plays in 20 minutes and reminds a lot of the original Final Fantasy. And I mean uh, Final Fantasy 1, meaning that it can be brutal, meaning that uh, you, you overshoot, you die, meaning that uh, it feels like playing a party and meaning that the black wizard rocks because uh, okay the, the story of the game is that the demon lord terra uh, kidnapped the princess and a group of heroes has been sent to uh, to defeat it but they were defeated so it the, there's only left the the apprentice of the wizard of the party which is, who is the titular unreliable wizard, who is sent, okay, go on and save the princess. And you are set on a journey. The game pl is played entirely with cards, okay. 
uh, you have a card as a map, you have cards as monsters, you have cards as your spellbook and your end and uh, your companions and everything else. You have just two tokens, one is the wizard and one is the demon lord terror at the end of your track. You move along a track, when you move along the track you uh, lose hit points depending on where you move. When you get to a village you get to restore hit points depending on the village you move on. And for everything else you move on different terrains. These different terrains work as modifier for the monster you find on them. When you move on a terrain you find a monster and you have to battle this monster. How do you create the monster? You pick the monster card, so there is the base stats and the vulnerabilities of the monster, and you add it to the terrain as a modifier. You will have, uh, you will basically align three different set of cubes which will represent the magic defense and the attacks of the monster. For instance, the bat which is called, they are they are all cool Japanese name. Let's see if I can take one or so like Mizu or something like that. So you have Metsi, uh, okay, that, that's for from the expansion actually. But uh, you have a lot of cool monsters and the bat-like monsters in the jungle get stronger on the blue magic defense. But if they go on the desert, you, they will get stronger on the red and green. And uh, you attack them by playing spells. You can play spells from your hand uh, by combining the cards you have. Ev every card you have works either as a basic component of a spell, so it can work on its own, or it can be combined to form a spell with another card. Depending on the card you combine it with, you get a different spell, which gets a different kind of attack or gets a different kind of effect. For instance, you can have a spell of healing, which is very, very handy. And uh, that's how you play, basically. The, every time you check the abilities you have on the field you are playing, uh, then you do your attack to the monster, you subtract the magic defense from the monster, which depends from the basic natural magic, magic defense of the monster, plus the, the environmental modifiers, that's the damage you give it you deal to the monster. If the monster is still alive, you get, the monster gets to, uh, to damage you back and uh, the combat goes on until you win or you are defeated. If you are defeated, it's game over, otherwise you continue. When you get to defeat the monster, in the base game, you basically get the ability card the monster was defending. So you basically get either a companion or another piece of spell, which combines uh, making you stronger. You recover a bit of HP depending on the recovery value on the monster and you go on. You rinse and repeat until you get powerful enough to get to the end of the track with the Demon Lord Terra. You pick your path because uh, uh, you really need to see the picture of the map but the map has uh, hexagonal squares and you move on hexagonal squares of different terrains so you basically get to pick the, the monster you face uh, along the track. You have to face enough monster to get powerful enough to fight the Lord Terra because the Lord Terra is very, very strong. In the case you get to zero HPs and you have a companion with you, you can sacrifice the companion and uh, get to eight, back to eight HP. Otherwise the companion will fight along you, so it will give you a permanent modifier to some attacks exactly like the modifiers of the terrain for the monsters. And that's basically the game. It plays very fast, it is very simple to learn, it is the mechanic of combining the spells to damage the monster is extremely addictive and the way the monsters combine with the terrain type is extremely refreshing. Every game for a lot of time will seem fresh and you will play it a lot. So that's the game described in five minutes, I think. <laughs> that sounds pretty good. Yeah, now uh, a couple of consideration from a veteran solo game player. First, the, the, the real question you should ask yourself is, do you enjoy solo games, punk, meaning? <laughs> uh, if you like playing solo game, if you like to play Maki, for example, you will love this game because uh, it's uh, 
a perfect gem, it's beautiful. It's a small game you set up very quickly, you can play, you can die horribly or win, but you will be extremely satisfied, you will want to play another game, especially if you didn't win. The combination you get, uh, remember a lot of roguelike games, of course you don't carry other stuff from one game to the other, so it's not really roguelike, but the way the stuff composed to create you, uh, to seed you a different adventure every time, is uh, magnificent, is beautiful. I, I think uh, if I had to summarize Japanese design in a word that's elegant, and this game is very elegant, okay? Uh, uh, I, yes. I had a, a question in general. How much does the game relies on luck and feels very real that because I with game like this sometimes it can feel like you don't have that much impact on the successes of your own like a good roguelike works when you have a lot of information and you can use that information to progress and roguelikes are a little bit less fun when it feels like from the get go uh, the moment that you start your run uh your yeah, run is already the, the, over because of the you don't have the luck to to get to the end this time yeah the, so... the seeding of the adventure is completely against you you mean yeah, uh, exactly okay uh so this game uh, i would like to make a comparison uh but uh, i will first uh, address directly your question uh, this game is a bit reliant about luck uh, be, uh, reliant on luck because for instance uh, depending on your playstyle you could find uh, yourself better with some uh, advancements uh, instead of others for instance uh, when I get early, early enough the healing spell uh, the components to cast the healing spell I, I feel I can always complete the game uh, also for instance I like a lot to play with the companion of the porcupine which deals uh, immediately to damage at every uh, enemy you encounter because it makes me able to one shot the weakest uh, monsters but this isn't entirely this isn't uh, really the, the deal because uh, there is always a path to completion so maybe for your playstyle it could be harder to get there but since you know in advance the monster you will be getting in which the rain uh, you are basically and you know the cards you have in hand because uh, you pick basically everything except one every time uh, you know uh, the direction you have to take to be more successful so the the, the real uh, luck component is depending just on the advancement you get earlier or later that is the only luck uh, factor and besides that the game feels pretty new every time because of course the combination of monsters and terrains uh, makes it uh, uh, very interesting and this is why i would like to do a comparison with the precursor of final girl with hostage negotiator which is a pretty fun solo game. Yeah, a great uh, uh, solo yeah. game. I think that Fen talked about it a, yeah, like a exactly. fair few episodes back. In Hostage Negotiator, uh, you got dice, so that there is a lot more la potential luck involved, but you see you getting better, okay? In Hostage Negotiator, you, you will start your first negotiation uh, where you will say, okay, if uh, this roll uh, doesn't do any good, uh, the hostage is lost, I've lost. And after a while, you will learn the set of, com the combination of things you will need to do in order to ensure that that specific die roll is not as damaging as you would do. And this is the kind of same improvement you get by playing a reliable wizard. Because when you get uh, um, to play a reliable wizard, uh, you get better. You know, okay, uh, this monster has to the magic defense on red, and at this moment I cannot uh, go against it. So let's go left and see what I can do. Or I cannot definitely fight again unless I go to this town and recover six hit points. Or even more interestingly, 
I decide to not recover six hit points because if I go to the town, I'll get this detour. I, I will not fight that monster and I need that ability. So I will try to risk it, not get to the town and uh, fight and eventually lose a companion to go on. But I will push forward to get this exactly component of spell I need. So uh, the game is interesting, of course, the, the choices are still a bit blind because uh, uh, the farther you go, the more you are, can, can be sure that uh, what you are searching for is still there or not. But uh, it's very compelling. Of course, it's a 20 minute game, so the complexity cannot be absolutely... It, uh, it doesn't have the depth of a Kingdom Death Monster campaign with, uh, with the ramification and choices. But it's a very, very interesting game. Especially because it plays, uh, it, it stays in a little box, it plays in, I think, a 20 card or so. And uh, it, it's a very, very fast and elegant game for a soul play. I mean,. Uh, while you were play, while you were talking about uh, Turing Machine, I could have played one game, probably, <laughs> in all the time. So that's it. Uh, the game has been recently reprinted and translated to English and Spanish by Salt and Pepper Games, and uh, these guys are doing a lot of great solo games and new games. For instance, they did uh, Witchcraft and Battle of Versailles. Which is another game I would really talk about, would really want to talk about uh, in the future. And this gets also an expansion from Kami by, still from uh, a game from Kami Bayashi, which is a reliable wizard and unstable spirit towers, where you fight uh, uh, composite monsters and other stuff, and you get gear and you pay abilities with crystals. So that's like Final Fantasy II. <laughs> but uh, one thing I. Uh, I, it would be unfair to talk about this because I played it a bit less than the base game because I'm still playing quite a lot of the base game. Of course, uh, I'm not continuously playing this, but since I travel a bit for work, uh, that's the game I carry along in the last yeah. few days. Uh, having so a ready to travel game is always really, really nice. Yeah, exactly. The, the, the only real problem with traveling with this is that uh, if your flight or your uh, tra your train isn't stable, uh, the, the, the square, the, the, the X's are so small that you will move your chapter around all the time. But it's beautiful and the mechanic of composition is addictive, both for uh, spells and for monsters. So that's it. My recommendation in the... E Try it, and if you don't like it, it's just twenty dollars lost or so. So, <laughs> wonderful. All right. Uh, now I guess it's time to move on to our next game, which is uh, Artisan of uh, Splendid Vale. Artisan of correct? Splendid Vale. The mysterious. So, um, I guess compared to the other two games, it's a quite big game. It's a um, two to four player. Or one to four player if you um, have a slightly masochistic side. Um, um, adventure campaign game that you technically could also chuck into the uh, legacy game box because you do um, change the components. There, uh, it works uh, works a lot with uh, stickers you put on things and. Um, yeah, so there is a, um, just to get that out of the way, there is a recharge pack available for it. Um, if you finish the campaign, you can reset your game with the recharge pack and either play again a or... fundamental um, component, yes. Or um, resell it. Um, <clears throat> so, um, it's by uh, Nikki Valens and published by Renegade Game Studios. And um, I think it was in Kickstarter two, three years ago. It was uh, officially from, uh, according to Balkan Week, released in 2022. But I think I got mine in 2023, but yeah, whatever. Um, so, um, I'll just go quickly over how the game generally plays and then I'll go into what makes the game special in my eyes and um, 
also what you need to expect from the game because I, I noticed when when first of all when I play, play when I started playing it myself and also when I look at um, comments on board game geek a lot of people go into the game with a different set of expectations and um, some are disappointed and some are excited like I am <laughs> so um, the game is um, more or less divided in um, well kind of three parts you have your classic um, choose your own adventure type of story uh, game where you uh, have a storybook you have story entries and you can make decisions and they tell you to which new entry you go and um, <clears throat> so that's one part um, it ties in with a map of the valley, the Vale, yeah, Splendent Vale, that's its name, um, <clears throat> where you have several locations. Um, at the start of the game, you don't have anything written in there yet, so all the locations are just blank boxes. But uh, the game basically tells you, hey, now in uh, that box, you write in this name and this number, and um, then you can as a group decide, hey, now let's explore this location. You flip open your books and read the story entry. Um, in these books, there are sometimes um, story entries that are basically maps. Um, like when you, for example, uh, go into some dungeon and explore it, you uh, might be in a room and the room might be pictured in the storybook and um, in this picture there are again different numbers uh, which also lead to different story entries and um, most of those end with okay now you can return to the room and um, um, look at something else there um, then sometimes things happen um, you encounter bad guys or uh, maybe the dungeon you're in starts to crumble around you and you have to hurry out. Um, so you get to an action sequence um, for which you have your action scene book um, where the story entry will tell you, okay, now go to page whatever, 22, 23, and then you flip it open. And um, on the one side or on the right side, you have uh, basically a map with a hex grid and on the left side you have setup rules um, an initiative track and uh, yeah basically uh, special rules for this encounter or action scene and uh, what your goal for it is also the uh, stats for your opponents and then you play the scene and um, it will tell you, hey, if you uh, fulfill this condition, go to this story entry and then you get back into the story. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And then there's the third part, um, which is partly in the title, the artisan part. So all four characters you can play in this game are artisans of some kind. Um, you have an apothecary, um, an artificer, a tailor and a mason. Um, <clears throat> Now, maybe it's uh, different for English native speakers, but um, I wouldn't have guessed for two of them <laughs> what they actually do. Um, Javi Ferreira has horns. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, the apothecary basically brews potions. Um, the tailor sews uh, like um, some item, some armor or um, stuff like that. Um, the artificer uh, actually improves their own or his own body um, with uh, well upgrades uh, to his prosthetics and stuff and uh, the mason that, that's a very interesting thing about the, the whole world um, basically masons in this world are people who can feel the uh, emotions and intentions of um, inanimate Stone. objects yeah <laughs> for example a door might have the the, the, the wish to um, 
be able to close securely yeah to to keep uh, the people in the house safe for example yeah and um, so masons can feel this and um, improve these things with runes so that is um, kind of cute i yeah, like it so um, the mason basically can take uh, any uh, or most of the items you encounter and um, check okay how can i improve what these items want to do and um, yeah just uh, give them some add, add some runes into them and uh, so they become st become stronger um yeah and so this whole crafting thing is an uh, an integral part of the whole game um <clears throat> now um let's quickly go into the action scenes how they play um at the start of an action scene again the game tells you hey how do you set it up um it's really easy and quick um and you have uh, 12 of these uh, purplish um, dice and you start by rolling eight of them and these are your dice pool every time it's a player's turn they roll three additional dice and add them to the pool um, if they don't can if they can't take three dice because the pool is already full um, you have already all the 12 dice in there they take as many as are left and uh, add them and then they can do up to two actions um, the same action can be done twice except for you can only do one attack action um, each turn and each action has a, a symbol in front of it uh, for example the move action has a uh, boot uh, the punch action your standard attack has a pow symbol and um, <clears throat> to do an action you have to spend one die from the pool with the fitting symbol yeah? um, some actions might need two dies uh, to activate some actions might have two symbols and you could, can choose one of them to spend um, most actions can be boosted um, which means you spend the symbol that is asked for for example the punch action you need a power symbol and then you can also spend a plus symbol in addition to that to boost the attack which increases all underlined numerical values of the action by one um, for example the move action is standard, standard move action is move two if you boost it you can move three um, and yeah and that's basically the player turn um, <clears throat> and um, I, I mentioned it there is an initiative tracker so um, you go it in order if you reach the end you start at the beginning again and it tells you whose turn it is it if it's a um, NPC's turn you roll a die and each NPC has um, a table and depending on the result of the die roll it tells you what this npc will do uh, will they move and attack will they buff another uh, npc or whatever and um yeah <clears throat> and that's mostly uh, well that's the core of how it works um if um, oh yeah uh, each npc um, has a um, toughness value and um, that's actually a thing I am thinking of adapting for tabletop RPGs um, if you have an action scene where you fight for example um, four um, of uh, some bandits all the same and they have an, a leader with them which means in the action scene book you have two tables one for the leader and one for the uh, minions basically um, you don't track health for each minion individually you track how much damage you deal to the minions and as soon as an attack deals so much damage that the total damage dealt to minions exceeds the toughness of one minion that minion dies so basically the whole group gets the damage together and as soon as you have enough damage to kill one of them the last one to receive damage dies. So, Which? for instance, uh, four minions uh, with a toughness of two will have a total of eight, and if you roll six damage, you down three of them. 
No, um, you exactly. can't. No, that, that can't work. Uh, that's actually in the rules. Like if you would kill two minions with one attack, you only kill one. Yeah? Um, so it's not like, oh, look, five meters over there, another one just crumbled oh, under my no, sword okay. strike. <laughs> But um, basically, if you have these four minions, each has five toughness, you deal two damage to the first one, uh, two damage to the second one, and then deal three damage to the third one, the third one dies, because in total you dealt more than five damage with this last attack, and um, the rest of the group now has two damage left. Yeah? <clears throat> um, which makes it really simple to handle and also leads to some interesting uh, tactical decisions uh, like okay i know with the next attack i will kill one so who do i want to kill for sure yeah i'm sure um, it makes the fight a lot faster too yes definitely that's um, quite nice also there is no to hit roll so attacks hit um, and usually attacks deal a flat amount of damage plus additional damage based on die roll um, but um, yeah so you don't uh, it, the game doesn't bother with okay now you first have to roll whether you hit and then the opponent maybe can dodge or whatever no you attack you hit you roll how much damage you deal um, so it's it's really um, simplified in that way um, it's not like the old warhammer roll to hit okay roll to wound okay roll the damage Yes. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> now, um, what you didn't like. Yeah. <laughs> let's start with the story um, section. Um, you have not one storybook, but you have four storybooks, one for each character. And they are so, big. Yes, they are, you know, chunky books. Um, I know they don't have a page number, but... Um, <clears throat> I mean, the highest story entry number is 1,000. Um, they, they look like medium-sized city uh, phone books from Hold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the interesting thing here is character. Well, I mean, um, if you open one story entry, each character has the story entry in their book. So you could ask, okay, why do I need four books if everyone has the same story entry? Well... During story entries, there are sections for your character. And there are other sections where in your storybook it basically says, look, here another character says something. But it isn't in your book, it's only in their book. Um, and so the whole idea is that when you play with four players, um, you decide who is the narrator. They read what everyone has in their storybook. And when they reach a point where a specific character says or does something, that player takes over and narrates, okay, what does my character do? What does my character say? And then it switches back to the narrator. Oh, like the other, like a theater play. Yes, exactly. And um, also with the um, choices you can make, it also depends on the characters. Yeah? Different characters can have different options available to them. Yeah? Many options are tied in with their whole uh, crafting thing, for example. Um, and um, so, of, of course, the mason has different ways to open a door, for example. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and um, yeah, then also you have character specific story entries. Some of them um, have to do with crafting, for example. If um, the apothecary crafts a potion it's not just okay you look up in a list that you spend the components you get the potion no you read the story entry where where you actually have a whole description of how the character crafts these potions yeah? and um, which is really fun to read I think and um, for example when I crafted a healing potion it was like okay hey, let me add mangoes to it so they taste fun. Yeah, And <clears throat> so um, it's, yeah, um, that's, that's really something I enjoy. And um, also on the maps you explore, the numbers are different for the characters. So um, some characters can see things what other characters can't see. 
uh, which is particularly interesting. One of the characters is blind and um, so a lot has... of characters can see what another character cannot see. Yeah, and um, the blind character basically navigates the world differently. And at one point I was in a dark room. Three characters could see barely anything. That character could see the whole room because they didn't rely on light <laughs> to yeah. see anything. That's yeah. fun. Mm -hmm. uh, quick question. Uh, does the amount of text and description that there is for a reaction slows down the game or is that just a normal part of a... Uh... What's to be expected with uh, uh, artisans? Now here we come to what we expect from the game. Uh, basically, I, I think the, the closest and most fitting uh, comparison is actually a role-playing game. Um, if you view this game as a guided role-playing game, you have a pretty good impression of what to expect. Um, and I think then it becomes really fun when you really see yourself, okay, I'm playing this character now, but instead of deciding what they say, I have a script I follow. Yeah? And um, <clears throat> I mean, I, just today I played for, I think, one and a half hours and I spent these one and a half hours reading. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> I didn't have any action scene in this play session. And... Um, if you don't like that, this is not the game for you. Yeah? Um, so you can spend a lot of time reading, or if you play with multiple people, listening to people read. Yeah, um. <clears throat> yeah it's not everyone's cup of tea, I think. Uh, I actually find it, this aspect pretty interesting because this is a different, this is a novel approach to, to try to fit story segments without boring uh, people who isn't reading. So it's pretty interesting to see how it turns out. And another thing that I think fits the whole comparison to a um, role-playing session is you can't lose. Um, that's something several people complain about online, that during the action sequence, the characters can't die. So if you have a fight, you won't lose this fight. You will fight until you won. Yeah? And um, each character has a toughness of six. So you get damage. And once you get enough damage to equal or uh, surpass your toughness, you get an injury and reduce your damage by the value of the injury. And then you can get damage again. And if you again reach your toughness, you get another injury. Yeah? But you won't die. The injuries um, um, hinder you in some way. For example, um, here one character of mine um, is exhausted, which means they can only equip a single skill during an action sequence. Normally they can equip two skills. So as long as this character is exhausted, can only use one skill. And... Um, <clears throat> but no matter how many injuries, you will still be able to do something. Huh? Um, even if it's just, you know, punch the enemies. As I said, there's no two-hit roll. Um, you have a flat amount of damage you deal for sure. Um, so that's something people complain about. But then I thought about, well, I'm sure people play it differently, but Mm, with all the role-playing groups I had, or most of them, there was always this general understanding, we can't lose unless we do something really stupid. Yeah? Okay, of course I, I lose routinely at my role-playing games. <laughs> but so so it, it was really like always this understanding, your character won't die unless you, you, you want the character to die, basically. Yeah? But um, it and it kind of makes sense, especially in, in long term campaign role playing games. Hey, when you spend three years developing this character and leveling them up and whatnot, you don't want them to die because of bad die roll. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and pretty understandable. So yeah, so um, this game is not about 
will we win? It's about how do we win? Uh, and of course, if you want to have a challenge, you can set yourself challenges. You can say, hey, I'm trying to win these fights without getting injuries. Yeah? And um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, I personally, I really like the fights. I like the, the action scenes. I like that they are pretty simple. Um, and um, I also like that uh, the rules for how NPCs act are on the one hand pretty vague, but on the other hand also pretty simple. Um, because, for example, the, the the action sequence tells you, okay, this character now moves three and attacks. And, um, and the rules basically state, well, don't overthink it, just do what you feel like is right for this NPC in that moment. Yeah? Um, they try to make the most of their actions, so just go for it. If it's not perfect, it doesn't matter. Yeah? Um, so it's also not a game for people who like to play super tactical and um, <clears throat> think through the next uh, two or three turns or whatever. Um, Again, see, view it as a narration game, yeah? and that um, that makes sense. <clears throat> and um, yeah, so um, one thing I really would like to go into more detail is the whole crafting thing um, and character development. So for each character, you have a character sheet um, which you can fold out and. Um, <clears throat> You have um, basically a page where um, you have a picture of your character and um, potions they carry with them and damage and injuries. Then you have um, a um, page with um, all their abilities they um, can do or the actions they can do apart from um, any equipment. And, um, and then you get to the whole crafting and character development thing. And that is different for each character. Um, and it was actually what really um, grabbed my attention when I first encountered this game. Um, so, for example, the Mason. Um, they have a list of runes they can inscribe. They start with some of these runes filled in already. Um, and during play they encounter new runes. Um, when they want to craft or when they have a chance to craft, um, they can look at, a, at the back side of an item and it tells you an, a story entry in the Mason's book. Um, in the story entry it's basically, hey, um, what does this item feel and what does, what does it want to do? And then you have the different options how you can improve it. And it's usually two runes you need for it. So you can check, do I have the necessary runes? If yes, I can do this improvement. Yeah. <clears throat> the Apothecary, on the other hand, has like this uh, potion shelf and um, different ingredients. And each potion requires two ingredients. So you check basically the intersection of these two ingredients. And that's the potion you can craft with them. Ooh. Now you have different options. You can either say, well, I have found these two ingredients and I could craft potion with the entry number 784. I don't know what it does, but I'm just doing it and I'll see what I get. So but, uh, each character is a different mini game to do his thing. But apart from, you know, blindly crafting a potion and seeing what you get during the story, you also sometimes encounter recipes. So then you write down, okay, when I combine these two potions, oh, I get a healing potion. Well, I'm not exactly sure what exactly it does, but it gives me a good idea. Yeah? Um, or I find a potion, um, then I get a card with the effect, and then I can check, okay, hey, this, look, this looks like this potion in my shelf, so apparently that's what I can craft there. Yeah? Um, universe engineer the potion. Then you have the tailor. The tailor collects um, basically inspirations. Uh, they have their inspiration board and um, at different po points during the story they might uh, 
say, hey, this looks really interesting, gives me some ideas, and then you get a sticker, which you put on the inspiration board, and these stickers lead to two-digit numbers. And as soon as you have a two-digit number um, on your board, you take the appropriate card, and that tells you what you can craft now. Yeah? Wow. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah. Um, some numbers are part of one sticker, um, but others are part of two stickers. So you just don't need one inspiration, but two different inspirations um, to be able to craft that. And, and also you can combine uh, inspirations in different crafts? You can no. combine them differently? So the one... Uh, no. No. Oh, sad. No, <laughs> it's pretty fixed everything. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But there are also um, like different notes attached. Um, <clears throat> for example, I, I just um, got something um, that had um, the word reinforced scribbled on it. And this keyword allowed me to craft something for which I had inspiration, but I also needed this keyword in addition to the inspiration. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> and finally, uh, the artificer. Um, where it horns. becomes really interesting. <laughs> As um, blueprints! Um, so basically, in addition to the sword crafting, you get experience points. And each character has a um, basically some kind of uh, network of uh, dots they can fill out with their experience points. And they have small notes and big notes, and each big note is an additional skill or item or whatever, something they unlock. And um, when you get experience, you can fill out one note per experience point, and it has to be a note that's adjacent to an already filled out note or the central starting point. With the Artificer, experience and crafting is combined. So they have just this really big grid um, and several of these nodes have components in them. So that means whenever you get experience, you can fill out basically the blank nodes, but the um, nodes with materials pictures inside them, you can fill out when you craft. And then you can spend five materials to fill up five of these uh, material nodes. And they um, create circles around skills or upgrades or whatever. And uh, once you filled out all around one of these upgrades, you get this specific upgrade. Um, yeah, so uh, interesting. <laughs> and um, so each character, not just from their whole background and story feels very different, but also from this whole how they develop. Um, yeah. Um, the game is structured in a way that you basically play over several days. You have um, on the back side of your map, you have a calendar. Um, and this calendar, first of all, works as a uh, log of whatever you did. So during the whole story, several times you are told, hey, now write this into your log. and. Um, <clears throat> I had a longer break of like two or three weeks um, now, but I just look at my log, I skimmed it. Okay, what did I do? Oh yeah, right, that's what I did. And I was back in there, yeah? So that's really helpful. And... Um... <clears throat> that, that's actually a good question. How many sessions do you think it takes to, to go through the, the entire game? That's... Hard for me to tell right now. Um, I mean, there are, let me check, uh, 18, 20, 20, um, 29, no, 30 days on this calendar. Um, though the last one is each day after. So could be that you can play longer than 30 days. Um, you can, but it's not like one day is one session. Um, you can break at any time, basically. Um, it's really good in the action sequence, action scene book. For each action scene, there is an approximate playtime for this action scene, which they included. So 
groups when they get reach an action scene can decide do we have the time to finish this now or do we want to tackle this action scene at the start of the next session um, i mean for example yeah earlier i played for like one and a half hours and that was one day it was a day which where not a lot of things happened yeah? whereas um, another day i'm pretty sure i spent like five hours for one day um, so it's it's kind of hard to tell how many sessions. Um, I mean, Board Game Geeks has forty five to one thousand two hundred minutes playtime. I'm not sure that's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> that is a, a range. Well, it's not forty three <laughs> minutes, for instance. Yes. Um, but yeah, so. Um, this log is really great. And um, at the end of each day, you draw so-called interlude cards. Um, and it's basically the characters you play are living in this veil. And um, adventuring is kind of like their hobby. So um, in the evening, they get back home and they do things. Uh, they have friends, they have family, they have encounters with them. Um, they can decide, hey, this evening I want to focus on crafting something or hey, I want to spend time with a friend. Um, <clears throat> and um, yeah, so um, basically each day at the evening there is some downtime for the characters, which again is very similar to role-playing games. <laughs> and um, yeah, I kind of lost my train of thought here. Um, yeah, two other things that are noteworthy about this game. One is a minor thing, <laughs> um, the index um, of the rulebook. Um, the whole rulebook is very detailedly numbered. So, for example, um, when I look up toughness in the index, um, it has three sub um, points, um, companion toughness, mob toughness, and player toughness. And each has have a number, not a page number, but an entry number. So companion toughness is 308.3. And when I look it up, um, basically chapter three is uh, action scenes. And then 301 is setup, 302 is dice pool, 303 is initiative, and so on. And each rule has a subsequent numbering. <clears throat> so that's very thorough and really helps with finding specific things um, via the index. Because not like, okay, I'm looking something up, okay, this part is on these two pages, so I'd skim where is the thing I exact I'm looking for exactly. But it basically tells you which sentence the rule is you're looking for. Yeah? Um, and then the four characters are all queer. Um, yeah, th th they look at like that, you know? <laughs> so um, it's a game, an adventure game, a story-based game where all characters are queer, people of color, and um, two of the characters have disabilities, uh, you know, the blind character and the one with uh, prosthetics. Um, so that's pretty amazing. And it's really funny that there are actually comments online from uh, cis, white, heterosexual people that say, ah, that's stupid, there are no characters I can identify with. Like, yep, uh, now you know how it feels for <laughs> queer people in most mainstream media. Um, and what I also really like is each character has their pronouns printed on the character sheet. That's a nice little, little bit. Yeah, but you, what you don't have is some entry that says, hey, this character is gay or this character is trans. It's never explicitly mentioned. But when during the story 
a character gets home to their uh, same gendered spouse, you know, okay, they are bisexual or gay or whatever. Um, they are in a same sex relationship, but it's never called out as such yeah? because it's just it's just the way it is. Yeah? And um, so same with the um, disabilities. Um, it actually took me a bit to really get away. This character is actually blind. Um, but yeah, every time something is described from her perspective, it's described differently. Yeah? And yes, when she explores a room, she touches everything. Yeah? Um, she not just she isn't looking around, but she um, touches the books in the shelves. And books aren't really interesting to her, apparently. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so without calling these things out, they are in there. And um, it's I think that's really uh, amazing that they did this and how they did it. And um, I wish more games would, well, be brave enough to do something like that. You don't have to have a whole queer colored uh, disabled cast, but, um, you know, just put queer characters in there without calling them out as queer. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah. No, 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 your business at, at least, uh, the, if it's useful to the story, you just bring it up. Otherwise, no, no, no need to know. Actually, that, that is a trend in a lot of, of recent storytelling, and I think we cannot get uh, enough of that. So, that's a plus, yes. So, yeah, um, apart from that, the game is super easy and fast to set up um, because while it does have a lot of components, you have dozens of different meeples, which are really pretty. And um, when you set it up, I mean, you have the four character sheets, you have the four storybooks, and each character has a small box where they could, can put in their meeple and the cards they have. And that's it. And then you can start playing. And um, setting up the uh, action scenes is really simple because it exactly tells you, hey, what uh, meeples do you need? Where do you put them? Um, and packing it away is also pretty quick. Uh, I mean, especially if you play with four people, uh, everyone just puts all their components into their box and put it in the, box, in the, in the game box and that's it. And that leads me to the thing, um, <laughs> is it a one player game? <laughs> um, officially two to four players. Um, now, when I looked into this game, I wondered, well, if there are all these interactions in the storybooks, um, if each character has specific crafting things, like the mason can improve items from all characters. What if you don't have the mason in your group? Yeah. Um, so I really wondered how this works. Um, the answer is in the storybook, well, you skip the part where this character would say something because they are not present. With crafting, if the character is not present, you have the option because they are still in, this, in the world. So you do have the option to basically visit them in the evening and go, hey, look, uh, we found this. This might be interesting for you. Maybe you can do something cool with it. Then it can craft for you. Um, so the game is meant two to four players. Everyone plays one character. Um, of course, you can play more than one character uh, per player. It means you have to handle more than one of these storybooks. I'm playing solo, all four characters. It works. You do need to develop like kind of a system. For example, with the maps, I um, to go through each map, each book, look at the map, note down the numbers, and then the next book and check which numbers are different. Yeah? And just add to the list the, num the additional numbers. And uh, once I went through all books, I decide, okay, with which, which number do I start? Yeah? Um, <clears throat> same um, with um, or, or similar with uh, story entries where the characters um, talk with each other. Um, 
I open the story entry for each character, put a bookmark in them, and yes, I switch books. Um, it works, It's it takes some time to getting used to, but it's definitely doable. And um, But yeah, um, personally, I don't think I'd enjoy it if I played with less than four characters. Um, so if I had a group with uh, two other people, I definitely take a second character so everyone is present um, because I, I, I would really hate to read a story entry and notice, oh, here would be something which we don't read now because we don't have the character with us. That's, ah. Um, I mean, the game always tells you basically when you are missing a character. Uh, so, so um, how's, the how's the story in one word? How's the story in one word? Um, whew, uh, splendid. Okay, <laughs> which means good. Yes, I mean it's okay. uh, the the story. It's it's not a kid's story. Um, the the whole game, um, like the artwork and so, looks really cutesy and whatnot. Um, but my first hint that it might not be was actually when I opened the first uh, storybook and there is some artwork at the start, and I thought, hey, that looks nice. Until I noticed each of the pictures show a combat scene and um, where the character basically clubbers some cute animals and um, so yeah um, it does revolve a lot, a lot around community uh, something else that was touched on on board game geek where someone said well are the characters the bad guys yeah um, like pretty early in the game you encounter some bandits that want to to um, um, <clears throat> basically steal some artifacts from some ruins and you're like, okay, we fight you, we don't want you to steal these artifacts. And what do the characters do afterwards? They plunder the ruins. So um, at first glance you could say, yeah, right. <laughs> are we really good guys? Uh, we are basically going into ruins and stealing stuff until you realize, well, the characters basically recover things from their community that have been lost and there's also a lot of times like hey i'm taking these books with us and put them in the, 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 into our library or um, hey there are these great tools i found in this workshop and i'm giving them to the um to the um here um uh, to trainees or whatever so they can learn a craft and so um it's not as simple as, hey, we are plundering ruins, but it's really like, hey, all these lost places, all these lost books and and whatever, we are recovering them for our community. And um, so, yeah, we are actually the good guys. <laughs> <clears throat> this game looks very interesting and reminds me a bit of a uh, spirit island in the way that it looks. Yeah, it reminds me a bit of Lands of Land of Galzir or how the yeah. story unfolds. Uh, yeah, basically Lands of Galzir with a lot more combat. Oh, <laughs> all right. Uh, I think that unfortunately that's all the time that we have for this episode. I know that Alessio is already running on the rope, so you can yeah. catch <laughs> us over at patreoncom slash Uh And until next time, we have been the Last Standy. So it's going to be a goodbye from Alessio. Goodbye. From Kara. Bye. And from myself. But remember that the second E in Standy stands for... Entropy. Entropy. That's a good one. All right. <laughs>